My father was a drummer, but he didn't want me in the music business. So I didn't play drums until I got out of the Air Force. I was 21 when I started playing drums. You know. When I was about 10 or 11, I used to climb out of the window at night and go to the nightclub and dance. And if they let me sing, I would sing. And they'd throw the money on the floor, and I'd get, I'd get, uh, when I come home, I'd get a killing, you know. I think I was about 12, and uh, this bootleg, you see, Kansas City was dry on Sundays at that time. So, I, you know, sometimes the guys could slip in, sometimes we'd chip our money in and pay for a guy to go in to dance, and he'd come around to the side door and open it, and we had to run, you know, to sneak in. <laughs> but, you know, unfortunately, I missed it. And uh, this bootlegger said, hey, man, carry the whiskey in, and I'll get by you a ticket. So I had this coat on. This coat came way down to my knees, and I, had, I was full of whiskey. And when the police see me, they knew, yeah, we get, come, just come, come right on. So, but my first gig playing with a name artist was Hank Ballard and the Midnighters, the guy who, who did the twist, who was the original guy that did the twist. He was like Prince was today, I mean, as far as being risque and... They could dance and sing, and I mean, you know, the women would come up on the stage and take their panties off, and oh, it was it was booger booger, you know. And the first gig I got, we went to Nassau, Bahamas. When we got there, and the promoters brought us to to get something to eat in the nightclub over there. A woman a woman saw me and screamed, "Ah, that's him!" And I I thought she was joking. So she said, take, I was I had the dark glasses on. She said, take off your glasses. Yes, you're him. Why did you come back? Some lady said I had impregnated three women over there. So it was, it was different. But the good thing about it, in the daytime we would rehearse and the guys in the band, they like Coltrane. You know, I got to learn how to play the swing stuff and, 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 and later on I got into the jazz. I came back home uh, after about a year out there on the road. I just didn't like it because that was a lot of travel. This is during the time that the organ, B3 organ thing was happening. So I became, a B3 uh, drummer, and you know, I play a lot around town, playing a lot of free jazz and stuff like that. And uh, when I, I saw s some of my friends on the Dean Martin show out here in Los Angeles, I thought they had made it big time, man. You know, a Dean Martin show. Come on out. I came out, and I like to starve to death because I didn't know anybody, but I couldn't play their music because I was playing straight ahead and the organ trio stuff. I couldn't play no R, they were kind of doing a, a pop R&B stuff. I couldn't play it. I would walk 75 and 80 blocks because I didn't have a car. Can't say, well, man, we don't know you, you can't sit in. And this is a gentleman by the name of John Boudreaux, who was a famous drummer. He played on something you've gotten a lot of stuff in New Orleans, but he was a jazz drummer. And I met him, we met, and I happened to find his number. I kept his number. He said, man, I'll get you a gig. So he got me a gig playing with Charles Wright, who later, who later became Charles Wright in the Watson 103rd Street Rhythm Band. And it was a Thursday, we'd work on Thursday nights. I'd get on the bus with my drums and pay $12, I, you know, and it was a strip club, but on Thursday nights it was off night. So it was, and he fired me about five times because I couldn't play no R and B, you know. And about the fifth time, he said, "Hey man, you want the gig? You got it. Don't play no, just play straight forwards, and don't play no fields and nothing." I said, "Okay." So he had me playing straight forwards. Don't play no fields. Okay, okay. Play the, play with the time. Listen to the music, and I started to hear what was happening because I, I might be able to play a pocket you know, play a, a rhythm one time, but I was gone after that, you know, I was free. So uh, by, me, by me having to come all the way back to the basics, I learned how to, uh, you know, play with the different things in the 16th note thing. The reason I acquired that was because sing fours just seemed to be so boring to me. I said, man, I'm just playing fours. How can I really keep time? I gotta have something else. So I eventually, he didn't like the 16 notes at first, but I eventually worked them in. So by the time we did Express Yourself, then it was happening, you know, it was, it was pretty cool. But anyway, I did a record that I was, helped write it. I didn't know anything about the business. It was a record called Love Land. It was one, I think it was number two pop. 
you know, I didn't get my name on it or nothing like that. But I noticed when I would be going to, when I, we, would, we would rehearse long hours. We had a great band. And when I'd be leaving the band, he'd have people coming up to his house writing. And one of the guys that recorded Loveland before I did, his name was Don Trotter. And he, he would tell me, say, hey man, everything gonna be cool. You're gonna get a piece of it. I didn't know what he was talking about. I think because after the rehearsals, a lot of times Charles and I would write, you know. And so um, he recorded Loveland, you know. I mean, they finished it. I mean, we were writing it, but his version of it didn't hit. Mine did, because when I got ready, I said, man, why don't we record the song we were working on? He, Charles was very reluctant. He didn't want to do it. But when we did it, it you know, it became, you know, it became a hit. So it was, uh, then it got, you know, it got a little, it's got really strange, you know, things get strange a lot of times. And I remember uh, Don Trotter having his att attorney to call me uh, because Don Trotter didn't think he had gotten what he should have gotten. And they were going to court on this thing. And his attorney called me and said, well, hey man, you know, we just, we want you to come and testify about the, the song and we'll give you a gold record. I said, well, man, I ain't coming doing nothing with just a gold record. However, I don't have any once band gold records. Everything we did went gold. We didn't know it. I met Bill Withers through Charles Wright though. Bill Withers, uh, I think Charles Wright might have managed Bill Withers for a week or two or something, I don't know. And we grew, when I worked with him live, we grew every night. We must have grooved every night for two years. We just, we, we, we grooved, you know. And they got the one that I played on Use Me up here. They got my name spelled wrong, but that's all right. You know, everybody in the band got some writers for something except I think Ray Jackson, who didn't get any. But I thought I should have gotten a piece of Use Me and a piece of, uh, what's that, uh, Kissing My Love, you know, because that was a shuffle when we recorded it and I came up with the, the thing. I, should have, I thought I should have got a piece of it, I mean, uh, and I think Bill wanted to kind of do a change because, I mean, one day we were rehearsing up to his house and he said, man, everything you play got them GD-16 notes in it. So I said, well, you know, it's, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna probably need to be, might be needing to look for something else to do. So ironically, a contractor saw me one day coming out of the record plant. The record plant was on, it was, the old record plant was on 3rd Street. And he said, hey man, James Gapson, we've been looking for you for two years over the Motown. Can you read music? I said, yeah, I was lying. Well, I couldn't read. I said, yeah, you know, cause I didn't figure they would write, write, would write no drum music out. And I started getting calls, you know, and I'd go to Motown and I'd see this music and I didn't know what was happening. Motown was a, one of the best uh, training grounds I, I had ever had because when I was here in Los Angeles, they wrote out the open and close hi-hats, they wrote the crash, ride, tom, they wrote everything out. They don't really do that a lot of times nowadays. And so I couldn't read nothing, but they kept me. I found out later on, there was a producer by the name of James Carmichael. He said, man, keep him because he's got good timing. But meanwhile, what I did was I would go home and study. I got me some rhythm books and I would go home and study you know, eventually I got through it and I was able to read and, and um, you know, excel from there. But Motown was probably the school for me, I mean, as far as making records, you know. Old Billy Preston, man, what a famous, beautiful cat and a wonderful musician. We did a Ray Charles' last album together. Smokey Robinson. We did this, we did this cruising. I remember we did that cruising on a Saturday morning, I think we did maybe one or two takes and they kept the first one. And I said, man, this is the easiest money I've, I've ever made. I guess sometimes it happens like that. You know, it was just straight, a straight ahead happening thing. Ella James is up there, who was also a great lady. <clears throat> I never did get a chance to record with Ella, but um, I played with her uh, when they had the Playboy Club out in Century City Century City, Los Angeles, you know, in Century City, she opened up for Richard Pryor. And we got to play with her and she did one of the songs at last. That was one of the night I met, I met Jimmy Smith. He hit me in the stomach real hard and I drew my pistol on him because I didn't know who he was. But he was crazy, he'd come up, boom! 
And I didn't know who he was. You know, he hit me very hard, but he was a karate expert, so I guess he wasn't scared of nobody. But I didn't know, I didn't know who he was, you know. <laughs> what happened one day, I played a record by the Jackson 5 called Dancing Machine. And I was just getting my reading together. And they had a boom, 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 boom. The intro, boom, boom. I said, boom, 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 boom. And they, everything stopped. I said, I know I'm fired. Because they used to just fire people. If they couldn't cut their parts, they'd bring you out and get somebody else. They said, hey, can you, about five minutes, I just knew I was gone. They said, can you do that again? I said, yeah. I couldn't even the dum dum bum da 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 da. I was so nervous I couldn't. Even, they had to cut the tape and, and and bring that in. But after that, they would let me try certain things. You know, certain things. I mean, like uh, when the disco thing came in, like a uh, the Diana Ross thing, uh, Love Hangover. Uh, I, the way that I would play the hi hat was different than the ones that the guys played back east. And this lady here was one take. Um, Cheryl Lynn, we did uh, Got to Be Real. Boy, that was wonderful. This, this is almost like my collection, almost everything I put. <laughs> but um, it was great times, you know. No chart. No chart. Cheryl Lynn said, well, hey, you know, I could have played that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, um, I Will Survive was the one, that was a disco thing. That was one take. And that was because we had been working on, we thought it was the A side all day. And Freddie Parent said, hey man, let's just do this one thing. This is the B side before the session's over because it was a double session and they didn't want to pay the overtime. He said, in fact, I'll put the, no, 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 I'll put the intro on that myself. Counted it off, we, thank you. We did that and that became one of the biggest disco records. You know, uh, Marvin Gaye was great. Uh, I Want You, I remember uh, we were waiting on the music and uh, I had started getting double scales. So I was kind of worried. I said, maybe they ain't gonna want, might not want to pay me today. And I just started playing, boom, boom, you know, boom, 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 you know, boom, 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 you know. I started playing that. I just started playing. Chuck Rainey came in. Did Chuck tell you about that? Came in and we got a group. Leon Ward came out and said, hey, man, just keep playing. If you notice, there's no bridge in that. It's just a, a song. Wow, man. Peaches and Herb, here it is, wow. This was a, we had a good time making this record here. Um, Shake Your Groove thing, the hit Reunited. Reunited was one take. <clears throat> and the reason why, when I heard it, I, and I usually don't say nothing, but I was telling Freddie Parent, I said, man, that sounds like a hit record. I think that that's, that's it. You know, cause the track was so perfect and pretty. He said, I'm, I'm gonna take your word for it. And, you know, it turned out to be a number one pop. I was, that was a blessing. But, you know, great people, you know, good singers. You know, it's been, it's been a, I have, I have had an exciting life. I've got to play a lot of different kinds of music, which, which is cool. I mean, like Beck, I mean, you never know what you're going to play when you're going there. It's great, I mean, because he's very adventurous, you know. Paul McCartney was great. I got to work with him. I'd go over to Ray Charles' studio a lot of times and work with him. And uh, he was remarkable. I mean, he said, well, man, I, he'd come on, take me. He'd hate, because he likes to do everything himself. I'd lead him to the drums. He would mic up the drums himself. And his console was in Braille. A lot of times it would be just him, me and him in there all day. You know, he, he was cool, Ray Charles, you know. He, he, I heard, and I'd hear him singing the background parts. And one time I saw him transfer a 16 track to a 24 track. That's when they was using tape. I was, that was it for me. He did that, I guess, through listening to the signals and stuff. So he was, you know, he was remarkable. You know, it's, it's been, it's been, a, it's been, it's been beautiful, man. It's been a good ride. I mean, you know, uh, when I came out here, I said, well, man, if I just get to hear myself on the radio one time playing something, I'd be satisfied, but man, I didn't, you know, God is great. He is, I mean, for me to, you know, hear myself, I, at one time, it would be four and five charts, songs that charted that I would hear, you know, for, for years it was like that. That's a blessing. <laughs>